And the metabolic zone, our definition of it is that the blood ketone levels actually rise to the level of blood glucose and above. So if you can produce sustained hypoglycemia with carbohydrate and calorie restriction and elevate blood ketones, you can, it actually makes the, the uh, hypoglycemia tolerable. So the ketones replace the uh, glucose as the primary energy fuel for the brain. And it basically keeps the brain metabolism uh, optimized and uh, prevents fluctuations in, uh, in your mood and your energy levels if you can sustain therapeutic ketosis uh, with uh, carbohydrate and calorie restriction. And if a person can do that, and they need to take it upon themselves because someone who's 250 pounds with metabolic syndrome is going to have a different adaptive response to uh, calorie restriction and carbohydrate restriction than the lean athlete that's 170 pounds who's using it, you know, for, uh, for, to treat a condition. So it's not a one size fits all. And the carbohydrate threshold that's needed for individuals to maintain nutritional ketosis can vary widely. Like I can get 100 and 150 grams of carbohydrates a day. Sometimes, if I'm really active, and still maintain nutritional ketosis. Where interesting, yeah, and only if I'm very say, active. Most, so, most people, uh, and it's high in fiber. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you know, so that that's this distinction too. If someone's getting 100 grams of carbohydrates, well, are you getting it from broccoli and salads, or are you getting it from cookies uh, and candy? You know, yeah. so <laughs> you need there, there needs to go. be a clear, and that's why. I think the just assigning macronutrients, you know, for, for diet it can be counterproductive in some ways. So I think the composition of the food is equally important, especially in some people that just have very stubborn, persistent allergies that will impact their metabolic health and overall physiology. If your body is fighting something off with an allergic reaction, it's going to compromise the metabolic health. So that's why removing allergens from the diet mm -hmm. Uh, is important, and there are several books out there that address this issue. Elaine Canton wrote a book called The Canton Ketogenic Diet, mm -hmm. and that's been a useful uh, resource for a lot of people that come to me. They say, you know, I, I want to start the ketogenic diet, but, uh, you know, uh, I can't eat dairy. How do I follow it if I can't eat dairy or if I can't, mm -hmm. you know, eat these other foods? And, and there's not a whole lot of ketogenic diet books out there <laughs> that promote the diet and give an outline of the diet that's dairy free and mm -hmm. Elaine Canton's book uh, addresses that um, and I think you know there's as people are becoming more aware of these issues that you mentioned uh, especially with dairy I think people are looking to seek resources that can guide them to maintaining nutritional ketosis with a, a restriction of dairy protein. Well let's talk about the, what the, the meter that you had mentioned that people can get yeah. at the drugstore uh, I'm assuming it's a finger prick model, and that there's a stick, yeah. uh, a, a, a stick of regions or strips that you would use and purchase the, independent of that. Do, do yeah. these require a prescription of a, from a physician, or can anyone walk into a drugstore and pick up one of these? Yeah, and there's a variety of models out there. I use um, the most common one that you hear people talking about is uh, Abbott Labs makes it. It's called the Precision Extra, and uh, the glucose meter strips are about 50 cents per strip but the ketone strips can range from you know three dollars to six dollars per wow. strip so they can be expensive uh, but what I find is that patients may just use a blood glucose or blood ketone meter maybe once a week and they'll use the uh, urine ketone strips you know throughout the week to check their urine ketones and they may just do a couple blood measurements mm -hmm. uh, Typically, you know, if, if your blood glucose stays 70 and below with carbohydrate, 75 and below with carbohydrate restriction, it's a, there's a good chance that, you know, you'll be in nutritional ketosis. Okay. Um, another, you know, simple way to do it. And that's what you've seen from the it. research when, you, when people do this. When they're below 75, you can save yourself yeah. the expense and inconvenience of doing the blood ketones because most of the time you're going to be below, you're in, going to be in ketosis. Yeah, yeah. And... You know, a, a cheap way to do it is just with the urine ketone strips. And if your 
in ketosis by evidence of you know ketones in your urine mm -hmm. the you're in a situation where you likely have depleted glycogen stores in the liver you you're maintaining uh, low blood glucose so the the driver for hepatic ketogenesis is low blood glucose and low uh, glycogen levels in the liver depleted glycogen so your body really won't make ketones and they won't spill over in the urine unless you've achieved that level of glycogen depletion. So that's a good biomarker that you know, you're know you in nutritional ketosis. I opt to use the blood ketone meter, uh, the precision extra meter. Um, there's a Nova Max Plus meter that measured ketones, but this measures them lower than we found that it's relatively inaccurate. We, we found that the precision extra meter, uh, which I have a number of these meters, uh, another one is the cardio check meter and this is an interesting meter because it can measure glucose ketones hdl ldl triglycerides and a number of things um, so these are you can buy these at any cvs walgreens any and drug is there a prescription store. that's required no prescription required um, your requires money though okay. <laughs> so the, the strips are pretty expensive and uh, you can get them at diabetes wholesale you know uh, places online sure. amazon.com sells them online. What I typically do, eBay, you can get them on eBay. I look for a sale and I buy a whole bunch of them at one time, typically thousands of them because we do so many experiments. I literally bought like 20,000 ketone strips, you know, uh, <laughs> because we do so many, uh, so many blood measurements with the experiments that we do. Um, so I have a big stash here that, that we use, and, uh, and we compare the measurements to the biochemical assays done with very expensive equipment at uh, Case Western University, mm -hmm. and we found that these meters are actually very accurate. They're, the ketone measurements are accurate, and the blood yeah. measurements are, right. are they're, they're precise and they're accurate. So okay. they're measuring, you know, repeated measurements of the same sample give you the same uh, the same numbers and they're also you know in the same ballpark yeah like, well um, it's wonderful stuff and it's yeah. the, thanks to the exponential growth in technology and i suspect in the not too distant future we'll have a little sensor we can put into our smartphone yeah. and then be able to <laughs> analyze it that way for even less expensive that would be ideal yeah like a little band-aid you know yeah. i'm working with you know, I know some companies or foundations that are working on this where you just put uh, something like a Band-Aid that has nano sensors that can detect the blood in your capillaries and basically give you a metabolomic profile of all the metabolites yeah. in your, you know, I think this technology is available to do this. It's gonna take some R&D sure. to actually develop a commercialized product. But, but, uh, but ultimately, you're going to want to have a, a, a protocol that you follow to achieve metabolic excellence, is what, and if, which is really yeah. why we're, we're meeting today to help us understand what that, what yeah. that pro, pro, protocol would be. So, uh, and I, I, I want to tap into your expertise because you guide so many people through this. So, uh, for the average person who's interested in this, intrigued with this concept, who is either is concerned about optimizing their health and longevity or treating uh, an existing cancer or preventing cancer, um, the, the typical person is not fat adapted. There prime, there's two fields to burn, fat and carbs, and most people are, I would say, and I suspect you would agree, over 99% are adapted to burn carbs as their primary fuel. Yeah. So the, the, our goal is to help them transition to that. And the, part of the, to achieve this metabolic excellence, but part of the reason for that too, is, is what you alluded to earlier, is that when you are adapted to burn fat as your primary fuel, you're, you are flexible. You don't have to eat every two to three hours. You can go yeah. for a full day and not be hungry, and that is the key. And mm -hmm. it just seems mm -hmm. like it, we're blowing smoke, but your hunger disappears mm -hmm. because you have fuel to burn. If you're not adapted to burn fat, then, yeah. you, don't, then you absolutely have to have those carbs, otherwise you're gonna be miserably hungry. So- it Becomes a crisis situation. Be, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll kill major, to get that food. Yeah, major practical advantages. To so, being fat adapted. So yeah. how how do we do this? You know, in my perspective, and in, in you know, I've got less experience than you, certainly, uh, in helping people apply this practically, but is is this concept called intermittent fasting, where we gradually allow people to restrict the window at which they're consuming food. So when I when I tell people to stop eating anything, all food except for water, for three hours before they go to bed, and then to gradually extend the time that they're consuming their first meal to the point where they're skipping breakfast. 
and they have a six to eight hour window where they're restricting their calories too. So in a, se in a sense, you almost have to calorie restrict, although I don't tell them to calorie restrict, but it's sort of an artifact of following that concept because you're, you're not eating food as long as through the day. So, and in that period, to provide substrates to, to, to make the transition to fat fuel burning as their primary fuel is to use um, fats that break down real easily that are healthy, like full of medium chain triglycerides, like coconut oil, which can substitute frequently for the glucose. It at least give them the energy that, they, that they, they don't have until they switch over. So I'm wondering what your comments are on that and any revisions that might make it easier for people to follow. Yeah. That's a lot of good points you bring up there, a lot of good topics of discussion. Uh, you name it, I've tried it. You know, I've tried intermittent fasting. I fasted for one week <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I found that it was very tolerable. I, I, was, I had the benefit of already being fat adapted mm -hmm. or keto adapted, but uh, the third day was a little bit, you know, I got a little bit hungry, but I wasn't hungry after about the fourth or fifth day. And by the seventh day, it was very easy. And I actually gave a, a you know a seminar on nutritional seminar on the day the the last day of my fasting and I'm you know showing people and I showed people my blood glucose which was 51 and my ketones were like uh, five or six millimolar so uh, <laughs> earlier in the morning I think I was like 44 or something my blood glucose so if a doctor saw that they would think I would be you know in in a coma so <laughs> uh, so you name it I've tried it and I think the you know, from a practical standpoint, the the important question is what's what's a person going to follow? Mm -hmm. So, from my perspective, the biggest hurdle here is compliance. Mm -hmm. Compliance to a dietary strategy that makes calorie restriction uh, feasible and possible. So, and and you know, carbohydrate restriction, high fat diet, intermittent fasting is one way to achieve that. And I found that uh, one meal per day kind of left me a little bit. I, I would tend to consume a little bit too much food, I think, on the single meal. I found two meals a day to be optimal for me. Mm -hmm. uh, although when I'm traveling, sometimes I'll go a whole day without eating. Uh, or sometimes I'll just eat once per day. Uh, for example, if I'm traveling in Europe, you know, or food's more expensive, or I have a pretty you know, busy itinerary, uh, one big meal at the end of the day is, is great. Um, and uh, can cut down in, on your budget for food too, you know. Uh, so it, uh, there's a lot of advantages, as you alluded to, to this pattern of intermittent fasting. And I think that it is a, a good strategy to promote metabolic health and to maintain nutritional ketosis if the person can adapt to it. You know, some lifestyles, people, you know, cannot readily adapt to it. But I found that most people can if they give it a try. Most mm -hmm. people are resistant, but once they try it, they're amazed at how much better they feel. Um, you know, and, and it's also, you know, you ask the question, are you a, a, an elite athlete? Are you, you know, why are you doing it? And uh, if your goal is to build muscle, uh, if you're into mm -hmm. you know powerlifting, uh, mm -hmm. it might be uh, intermittent fasting may not be mm -hmm. the best strategy for you. Or how about a pregnant uh, woman, which is I would also include in that category. Yeah, I think. Uh, or someone with adrenal stress too. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's there's much to be said for just eating when you're hungry, right? <laughs> and I think that you know we're we're programmed you know, by the, the, can, by the norms of society to eat breakfast, you know, mm -hmm. dinner and lunch and with snacks in between, right? Right. And, and we've also been told that eating more frequent meals is more beneficial. And breakfast and is the most important should, meal a day. Yeah, and those meals should be high in carbohydrates. And this creates, you know, a, a pattern of eating that I believe is unhealthy. Uh, and, it, and it's just not feasible. I mean, with, with my work schedule and uh, it would just be hard. It would, it would kind of de tap into my productivity. So, and you know, I've, I've frequently, I get blood work, you know, many, probably about four to five times a year. And I've gradually shifted from eating six meals per day, which I used to eat when I was, you know, very active, more active in, in athletics and uh, to this pattern of eating, which is like two meals per day. And 
all the, you know, my weight has come down a little bit, but I still maintain, I'm about 100 kilograms or, you know, 225 pounds. And I can maintain that my metabolic health is good. So I'm, I'm overweight, but I've been able to use uh, an intermittent fasting protocol, if you, want, if you want to call eating just twice per day, kind of like uh, a week intermittent fasting protocol, I've been able to maintain my strength and uh, my power to weight ratio, mm-hmm. if you want to call it that, with, uh, by reducing my meal frequency. I'm actually stronger now, pound for pound, than I was when I was eating. That is more, amazing. Once you give the body more, what it needs. Yeah, yeah, and, and the body does is pretty smart. You know, it just kind of takes what it needs when you give it the the right foods. And um, and I find that if your if your overall physiological health is better, your body will kind of break down, assimilate, and utilize the nutrients that you give it much more efficiently. Mm-hmm. So those, it'll, you'll have a repartitioning effect, and, and the, the nutrients will go preferentially to rebuilding and maintaining uh, muscle and, uh, and into energy pathways that kind of give you sustained energy effects. Whereas, you know, if you're eating carbohydrates or you're overeating carbohydrates, it just cause a metabolic situation where you have pro-inflammation, you're you fluctuations in blood glucose, which can decrease your your cognitive and physical performance. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a colleague of mine, Jeff Volick, uh, he works with advanced athletes. You know, these ultra endurance runners who run like a mm-hmm. uh, hundred miles at altitude. You know, sure. in the rain over hills, and uh, he develops their nutritional strategies. And uh, Jeff Volick has written books, The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance and has shown conclusively that, uh, at least in endurance athletes, requiring stamina and strength, that carbohydrate restriction, and even an intermittent fasting type feeding schedule is, is actually optimal to enhance physical performance. So he, he's demonstrated this and has a number of studies that, I and mean, Jeff has published probably over 250 peer-reviewed articles. Wow. So well, he's, he's definitely put out <laughs> enough I'm, research I'm not to, to ultra- validate this pattern, this way of eating, this carbohydrate restriction and decreased meal frequency. Yes, and that is a, a great strategy if you're going to use that. But I, if, if your goal, from my perspective, is longevity and optimal health, yeah. I don't think that's a wise strategy to, to achieve that. I think it's going to be counterproductive. I'm far more a fan of the high intensity, slower, less frequent type of uh, exercise. Although I used to do longer yeah. exercises and ran marathons when I was younger, and that yeah. is wise. Um, but I want to comment on one point you mentioned earlier, which was that, and I res- honor and respect that and, and recommend that principle also, is that listen to your body, that eat when you're hungry. But the caution and the caveat, I think, that one needs to apply here is that that's valid if you're adapted to burn fat as your primary fuel. If you're adapted to burn carbs, your mm-hmm. body's going to lie to you because it's going to want to fill those glycogen stores up. So I'm wondering if, uh, if you can from your experience in guiding people through this process, what your range is that you find people require to make this shift if they're applying intermittent fasting as a tool to achieve fat, ad- ad- fat adaptation? Yeah, it's a good question. And there's no easy answer to it, mm-hmm. but and I think it varies tremendously. Uh, some people just like to eat. I mean, some people like <laughs> the fact mm-hmm. of, you know, they have the time uh, the money and, and, you know, they enjoy eating and eating is a pleasurable thing. And I don't think people should deprive themselves of eating. And if eating more frequent, uh, is pleasurable to them and they can maintain metabolic health doing that, then, you know, I don't try to change their eating pattern if they don't want to. People need to want to change. And Mm -hmm. usually that results from some kind of underlying pathology. Mm -hmm. The doctor tells them they need to lose weight. Uh, they're trying to get in shape for an event or something. They have a diagnosis uh, of cancer? Y- yes, exactly. Um, so in these situations, you need to, you know, assess the person's current eating strategy. You need to assess their metabolic health. Blood, blood uh, work is important. You know, if they're, uh, you know, if they have some renal insufficiency, if they have... Uh, um, you know, different, uh, if they're, if they're hypercholesterolemia, if, you know, there's factors that need to be considered before giving someone advice, um, for a nutritional strategy. But, 
I think calorie restriction is basically uh, the benefits cannot be denied. And any eating pattern that promotes a tolerable means for calorie restriction is going to improve overall health and metabolic health. And but what's the carbo- range of time you think it takes people to achieve that in your experience? Is it one week, two weeks, three weeks, three months? Um, it depends on where they're coming from, but I think within four to six weeks, most people can fully adapt and embrace mm-hmm. a, a low carbohydrate, uh, reduced meal frequency eater, eating pattern. Mm-hmm. And I think it takes about four to six weeks. And actually, this would correlate with the, uh, the exercise performance studies done by Stephen Finney and Jeff Volek that mm-hmm. showed that the performance deficits that you see with carbohydrate restriction. Restricting carbohydrates can actually drop physical performance. And then this starts to come back up, you know, to baseline in about four weeks and in about six weeks, at least in uh, advanced cyclists, they can achieve far better. And that would be, that's kind of evidence for me that they're keto adapted Mm -hmm. in the sense that their body is better uh, utilizing, uh, transporting ketones maybe across the blood brain barrier and that they're, they're fully utilizing and, and optimizing, optimizing fats and ketones for fuel. Mm-hmm.